Welcome everyone once again. Let's talk about social inclusion. And today I'll start with this uh, question. Imagine that you're trying to solve a problem, but you're only looking at half of the information. Well, that's what happens sometimes with policy documents. And today with my guest, Jill Willen, we explore policy silences. So this is the voices, the experiences missing from official plans, in this case, related to policies um, fighting poverty. So Joe will help us um, uncover, understand how hidden perspectives can be crucial. Joe will help us explore um, creative research methods that bridge this gap and then ask why policymakers need to listen more attentively to this. Joe, welcome to our episode. Thank you. Uh, great to be here. Uh, citing a question, which I'm sure you'll address, uh, we need uh, we need to know where the silences are in policy documents because they can affect the understanding of the problem, in this case, uh, poverty. So tell us more about that and why you decided to study this topic. Yeah, so um, the paper that we're discussing this morning, which was uh, published as part of a special issue, um, comes from a, a broader research project. So the research project was funded by the Irish Research Council, just a small scale piece of research, and it was conducted in partnership with a group called ATD Ireland, um, who are all together in dignity, who are an international anti-poverty organisation, um, and with a, a group of community activists and friends uh, of ATD. So, so the idea was to do a piece of research that was going to be a benefit to ATD as a civic society group. Um, and ATD's mandate is around highlighting the hidden dimensions of poverty. Um, so, you know, we often have a econometric or statistical understanding of poverty. We maybe know how many people are experiencing different types of poverty and deprivation, but we don't always or often have a view of what happens behind those figures. So what does it mean? to be somebody experiencing relative poverty? What does it mean to be somebody experiencing deprivation? What are the textures of life like for people uh, who are experiencing poverty? And so this research was um, geared towards uncovering some of those hidden dimensions of poverty um, and particularly using creative techniques. So it was based on walking interviews. It was based on photography, uh, on mapping. Um, and so on, as ways to sort of capture um, and surface uh, lived experiences uh, of poverty. Um, and to your question, you know, policy silences, sometimes silences aren't necessarily overt or kind of deliberate. It can be about omission or what's not there or what's, you know, what's missing from the picture. And so this research was very much about trying to add a new dimension to our understanding of poverty so that we have a fuller picture. And what would you say then that is the highlights of your study? I think um, a study like this and, and, and others like it, but the highlights are the insights and the deep sort of nuanced understandings that come out of research like this. So again, it's, you know, and, you know, this is not this is I am not in any way saying that we don't need econometric or statistical understandings because we very much do. They tell us an awful lot at a macro level that's important. But we also need something that perhaps complements and fleshes out those statistics so that we're not just looking at graphs that are somehow untethered to anything real and meaningful. Uh, we're also understanding the experiences that perhaps lie be behind those graphs. And I suppose the, the key thing that emerged from this research was being able to uh, understand for the people that took part uh, what their experiences of poverty were like. Um, and so lots of things came out uh, of the study. So, for example, uh, lots of people that took part in the study spoke about experiencing uh, socioeconomic discrimination. Uh, being discriminated against because of their accent or their dress or their postcode, where they come from. Um, there was a strong link between those who would experience poverty in childhood and those who continued to experience periods of intense poverty as adults. Um, poverty was something that was characterized by many of the participants as being as much about a lack of options as it was about a lack of financial resources. 
And so these are the kinds of highlights that come out of this kind of grounded qualitative study um, that, again, you don't get with sort of larger level statistical research. Um, so it, it adds to that canon of knowledge. It allows us to build a more holistic evidence base. Uh, and the hope is that it would impact uh, on policy by making real that which can be a little bit abstract when it's hidden in statistics. And you mentioned uh, before the civic importance of the study and of the research project. Um, so what can these uh, findings, these new perspectives mean for uh, public policy? Well, again, it's about, um, it's a, I'm going to use a term called muckraking. I don't know if, uh, if you've ever heard of it, and, and perhaps people listening to this might uh, have heard of it. But uh, I talk about it in the broader project. Um, and... I suppose it's a particular type of sociological approach that exposes what would otherwise remain hidden to the people that need to see it most. Um, so it's a, it's associated in the first instance with a guy called Jacob Rees, who was a, a, a sort of a photojournalist who photographed the tenements in New York um, and then showed these pictures uh, to the middle class New Yorkers who were horrified by what they saw and who otherwise would have made, remained unaware of what they saw. And this led to reform uh, in terms of the tenements in New York. Uh, later, a sociologist called Gary T. Marks spoke about doing muckraking sociology, where, you know, you're very much doing sociology on the, on the side of the oppressed and discriminated against. Um, and you're exposing their stories, their narratives, their lives to the people that need to see it the most. And I suppose in a small way, I had hoped to do something similar in this project so that by documenting the real lives of people in their own words, by exposing some of their lived reality to hopefully policymakers, politicians, civil society groups and so on, that it might generate a response, that it might result in some action, that it might allow people to think differently about poverty as, again, not just something they see on a graph or they read about uh, in a, a paper in statistical terms, but something that's actually real, that has people behind it, that, you know, leads to particular types of life experiences. Um, and that is bad for everyone and, and all of society. So in, in a very small way, I hope to add to that project um, and to do muckraking sociology by exposing uh, you know, the findings to people that I feel need to hear them. And, and those people in the main are, are, are policy makers. Uh, let's follow up on that, uh, because by reading your article from this conversation. So what you are suggesting is, you know, a, a, a new approach, a different approach to understanding inclusion, or in this case, uh, exclusion beyond just graphs, um, yeah. with including these new methods. So what uh, that's what future research fo should focus on? Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's new. Um, mm -hmm. I think people have been doing it well and successfully for a long time. Uh, there is a hierarchy in terms of what research people pay attention to, and perhaps small-scale qualitative studies suffer a little bit from being placed at the bottom of that hierarchy. Um, I think that's something that maybe needs to change, and perhaps that's where the future lies, is in challenging orthodoxy when it comes to what's accepted um, as viable um, substantive research. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can only do that by continuing to conduct research of this type, um, but also speaking to other researchers doing research of this type so that there's a tapestry that's being brought together and it's not just discrete or siloed pieces of research. So I very much see that as something um, that we could think about doing in the future. I also think uh, creative methods um, so in, in the paper that we're discussing this morning, I write about how people are excluded or omitted uh, by not having ways in which to participate um, that cater to their particular needs or, or abilities or, or, or expressions and so on. Um, and so I think fostering creative ways of doing both research and policy making is an important point of consideration for the future also, because not everybody is able to take part in a direct way. Um, so we're sometimes good at doing inclusion. We ask people what they think. We ask them if they'd like to be interviewed or take part in a group or uh, a project. But maybe we need to think about, well, not everybody necessarily wants to be interviewed or be in a focus group or is comfortable in those spaces. So how are there other ways in which we can include people? So in this project, I, I went for a walk with people. We had a conversation. 
um they took some photographs i asked them to you know um draw a map of the walk and address the, the landmarks on the map and so on um and we also then as an output developed a a 12 minute animated short uh, which captured the voices of the participants um so again a creative way of exposing and unpacking and surfacing experiences of poverty in this case but i think creative methods could be broadly applied to different areas of, of, of social research. And I think that is very much something we should consider um, for the future. Mm -hmm. Great. Can you share with us, um, well, your own personal reflections uh, after, after conducting this study and uh, of these findings? Um, working with groups who are already at the cold face of these kinds of social issues is important. So my partnership with ATD and with the community activists uh, upon reflection was, you know, key to the success of this project and key to the outputs that have arisen from this project. Um, I think that's that's really important that as academics, we wouldn't be sort of siloed or in our, you know, ivory, to ivory towers uh, in, in quotation marks that we would actually um, seek partnership with, with civil society groups and civic society groups that are working on these issues day in, day out, because that's often where the best knowledge uh of these issues lies and you know we can bring something to that partnership and and they can bring something to that partnership so upon reflection that was a really key component uh, to the success of of the project and to the outputs including the the paper that we're discussing this morning um i've said it already but i think again thinking creatively about how to do research so that you can include people who mightn't be comfortable being included in conventional or traditional ways um you know, you can think about things like power in the research relationship and how to diffuse that. Um, so going for a walk with someone is a very equalizing thing. Uh, you're walking along together. There's less hierarchy. Uh, it's a conversation. Um, and the landscape itself becomes an important component of that relationship and often evokes uh, testimony that you wouldn't get in a conventional interview. So there are lots of reasons, again, to encourage creative research methods where possible. It's not going to always be feasible to, to use these kinds of methods there are some things that perhaps are more sensitive in nature and require more traditional or conventional approaches but where where reasonable and where possible um and reflecting on the success of the project i think the creative methods really are what allowed it to be as successful as it was mm -hmm. perfect um in no more than two sentences if you had to give a well a powerpoint uh presentation title to this conversation what would it be? No worries. I suppose what I probably would say is um, it's important to have a deeper understanding of what poverty means for people. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, Joe. That's that's probably where I would leave because if I if I keep going, it'll be five or six, seven, eight, nine, ten sentences. No, so. And it's and it's a great punchline, and we have a great episode. Joe, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Uh, for those who are watching us on YouTube, you can find. Um, uh, the article that we, uh, Joe and I just discussed, more information about the research project on the Let's Talk About Social Inclusion website. And this episode is also available in uh, any podcast platforms. We are on Twitter and we have a newsletter that we can subscribe to be uh, to know more episodes. <laughs>